No. Can you hear me now? Yes. I've, I've got an ear plugged up right now, so I'm, I can't quite okay. tell how loud I'm speaking. Loud enough? No. Loud enough? No. <laughs> no? Okay, so here's here's some uh, typical apiaries. Uh, this one is generally people with, with this type of pie have something they'll they follow almost everybody's recommendation to start with two hives, and you'll hear this other term called nuke or nucleus hive. And so once you get two, uh, they might swarm into a tree or whatever, and so you need something to put the <coughs> colony in, so you'll have this little nucleus colony. And so a lot of beekeepers will have these extra little nucleus colonies that they're just a colony only smaller. If they overcrowd that box, they'll take part of the population, put them in the big colonies, and they just manage it as a small hive for extra resources. So, so it's just a form of one of the tools a beekeeper uses. Uh, this guy over here, which is in uh, more urban areas, uh, he's a chef somewhere in New York. He's got his uh, hive on top of his restaurant. <coughs> Supposedly goes up there and gets honey out for his people. I believe that's the Hilton. Huh? I believe that's the Hilton. Is it? Yeah. Okay. And then you have people that have uh, neighbors that chop down trees and have, actually have an excavator and they deliver them to your property. <laughs> so that's what this 13 foot log is. It's, there's a colony right up in here. And as of yesterday, it's still alive. This is my backyard. <laughs> Uh, and here's, here's Ted's apiary. Ted's, Ted's mostly top bars, and, but he's got a Warry hive and a Langstroth hive. Okay. So as, as beekeepers, we like to you know, start with two hives, and you can get kind of carried away and get 20 or 30 in your yard without realizing it. So I'll just warn you up front, you can't get addicted. Uh, this one, uh, this slide, there's also, in some areas, there are legal requirements for municipalities. And here's what it looks like in Pierce County. In Kitsap County, we have nothing, nothing really in our, in our ordinance. But if you're in Pierce County, uh, they require you to register with the state. But the state requires you to register with the state. So that's nothing new. And they re require some that you can actually remove a remove a frame so they can be inspected or a top bar works the same way uh, and, and that's more or less copied from the state level they don't want they don't want some beekeeper building up disease in these colonies that are not managed uh, and Pierce County they don't like you to send swarms off into your neighbor's yard and become a nuisance for your neighbor clogs up the court systems <laughs> well, it doesn't really happen, but it could. And they want you to keep your site clean because then your neighbors have less to complain to them about. And the, the big restriction is don't put the hive right next to the property line and don't point it at your neighbors because bees, they have a flyway that they fly out with. And if you send that right into where your neighbor gets in their car, probably not a good thing. Or right to your neighbor's window on hot days, probably not a good thing. So most of it is reasonable. Uh, most ordinances, their beekeeping becomes more of a nuisance orient. If, if there's nothing else, you look up the rules on, on nuisances. And typically, if somebody will file a complaint, you'll go to the, to the county or city or whoever, and then, the, and then they will research it. And they, they may or may not have something to deal with. Generally, it's not a problem. Now, is this is this primarily for like in city, or is this also for rural? Uh, in in this case, it was all of uh, Pierce County. Okay. In Gig Harbor, there's a slight difference, but I don't even remember what the slight difference was. I think it was like five feet different in one of the ordinances. What was that? Thirty feet for property line. Okay. Yeah, thirty feet. But it's it's more just reasonable. In the county, you're not going to find really anybody uh, putting any kind of restrictions. Because un unless you actually see the hive, 
Like if, if I'm a worried neighbor, if I don't see your hive, I'll never know it's there. If, if I have a fence and it's right on the next side of the fence and I walk by that fence and I hear this humming, I'll probably get nervous and look over the fence and then I'll see it and then I'll really get worried. So if you, if you keep it away or out of sight from neighbors that might take objection to it, most of your problems go away. Yeah, yeah. So, something you want to look at is basically we don't have any ordinances because no one's made a problem of it. And part of that is just by maintaining a low profile. As George said, keep your keep your bees out of sight, keep them so they're not aimed at your neighbor. And and what and also if you are going to keep hives and if you have neighbors who you know are going to be interfering with by them, it's good to find out in advance if you have a neighbor who is susceptible, you know, who who has a, a serious allergic reaction. Now, if you just get stung and you swell up, yeah, that's not an allergic reaction, that's what the bee wants, okay? If you get stung and you can't breathe, that's an issue. And if your neighbor has an issue, then you need to go ahead and talk to them and see what's going to, what it's going to take to, to make everybody happy. But yeah, you I really agree. don't want to have your neighbor killed by a yellow jacket and you go to jail for negligence <laughs> because he thought it was on you. Yeah, I, I do re recommend you talk to your neighbors. Say you're thinking about getting honeybees, and just from the look on your face, you'll say, well, I don't want it next to their property, or, or yeah, that's a, that's an extra pair of hands that will come over and help me if I need help. Now here's, yeah. You mentioned having to register with the state. Yes, there's a state uh, Department of Agriculture has a form, and it costs five bucks for the first five hives. I think ten bucks for up to twenty-five hives. It's really cheap. It's a yearly thing. They, they just require that you have registration if yes. you uh, carry hot. Yes. Yes. Yeah, Jerry? And there's, there's a good reason for that. And that is, if you live somewhere and you register your bees with the state, and for whatever reason, maybe they're going to have a helicopter fly over and spray for mosquitoes, the state will contact you and give you a heads up. Um, some places I've been before, they've sprayed, they sprayed herbicides. I've got notices that I need to move my bees for the safety, for the safety of bees. And we move the bees, they give us in a week, two weeks, they're going to stage near there or spray herbicide or whatever. So that's actually a good reason to, to register. Um, there, there are no real bee inspectors in the state, so there aren't going to be people coming to your yard inspecting your bees across your property. But it's mainly so the state, and also for some statistics throughout the U.S., like the USDA. How many people keep bees? <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> yeah. I heard last year that the University of Washington was doing some studies with regards to the insect or worm uh, problems with beehives. I read about it in one of those. Yeah, the, the money that the state collects for the registration actually goes to WSU yeah. for their bee research yeah. program. Anything that's not consumed in the processing that So it's not another advantage to do it. Right, right. Uh, one thing that this is seems to be important for first year beekeepers is how much money is this thing going to cost me? And so we put together here a uh, typical year you're going to buy some education like this class, 50 bucks you can. You can buy online classes equivalent of this for in the two to three hundred range or four hundred. Uh, the wooden bear, wooden hives uh, typically one hundred and fifty to two hundred per hive, and usually there we tell people start with two hives. Uh, you're generally going to have a bee suit or and then some sort of tools, a smoker, a hive tool, and some others. And next week we'll talk all about tools and equipment. So this is just kind of a, a total up number. And package bees, I think they're up to 100 or 110 this year. I've heard various numbers. Or sometimes, if you look at local nukes, sometimes the, the per price of local nukes varies drastically. Sometimes they're as cheap as packages, and sometimes they're, they're twice as expensive. And then for, for new hives, you're going to want to pay sugar. You're going to want to feed them some sugar. Uh, so less than a 50-pound bag for a hive. And the, the bottom line is you're going to spend probably in the range of 
$500 to $1,000 this first year to get started in beekeeping. Uh, not all at once. <laughs> but no, not all, not all at once. Not all at once. Not all at once. I put it in my front door. Yeah, that works. <laughs> Can I say something? Just real quick. Just so people aren't about the cost of starting out in bees, is that you gotta remember that cost to get started, a couple of those, as you're talking about, to get fitted with all your equipment and some bee boxes for your bees. After that, the next year is cheap because you've got the bees, you manage them right, you're gonna split them, you're gonna divide them, you can grow. You don't need to buy any more bees if you manage them right, you take these classes and learn it. You have that equipment, that equipment will last you for 30 years. Your smoker, your your bee hat, your veil, it'll last you for years. So that's your initial cost to get started. Yeah, so it's actually pretty yeah. cheap. If you're looking at playing hockey or some other <laughs> sport. Yeah, yeah, so buying new equipment all the time. So our, our second year, uh, it depends. If you're really enthused, you there's other classes, more advanced classes, you might might decide to take those or not. Uh, if your bees live or die, you might have to repopulate hives, depending on how successful you are with overwintering your hive and depending on whether they've stored up enough for winter you may need to feed them a little bit more in the spring uh, and, and then there's that that really uh, so there were in the hundred to three hundred dollar range either if they do really well you're probably going to want to expand if they don't do so well you're going to be repopulated what is that bottom picture? What? What is that bottom picture? Oh, the, uh, well that's the other, uh, if you want more hives. <laughs> <laughs> and you start looking at catalogs. <laughs> there are different types of hives. Uh, that hive, it's, it's, uh, it's made by a guy in Utah. Very expensive, but they all cl clip together. They all clip together. And it's, he can do almost anything in that hive. It's very expensive. It puts you, it's going to blow your whole budget for several years to buy that hive. But, but there are opportunities to spend loads and loads of money in beekeeping if your bees do well. So if your bees just kind of do just okay and produce a little bit of honey for you, that's probably the ideal. Because you won't be so encouraged to go out there and spend lots of money and build up really fast. And you won't and you won't be so discouraged of having to repopulate hives that have died on you. So, so that's what you're looking for. It's a little bit of honey and surviving colonies. That's your goal. Otherwise, it can get expensive. And we're going to talk about hive types next week. Hive types. Uh, this is, I don't think there's a lot here. Uh, one thing about the library is in, in the library, there's a whole bunch of books. And, and this one I'll mention. It's a recent edition, a uh, pretty, th pretty thick book, uh, written in 17, 1789, and the first half of the book <coughs> is all about a beekeeper's, when he was the beekeeper that determined uh, whether the queen mates in the air or in the hive. Uh, and he was blind, and he was the guy that figured it out. It took him uh, several years to figure it out, and uh, his, his name was uh, Francis Hubert. And the last half of the book was, Paul had mentioned that the bees make this, this uh, wax. They bring it up, they chew it up, and they start constructing honeycomb. The last half of the book is, how do the bees construct the honeycomb? Where do they start? How do they build? How do they add on? Do they go back and rebuild structure? And fascinating reading if you have a lot of time. <laughs> but a lot of the beekeeping books that we have will be, there will be a lot of, of basic stuff, but then every once in a while you'll run into one of these that's just some guy had a lot of time and he really researched one specific item in extreme detail. So, so this is one, just one of the examples. Uh, let's see. Oh, and if you're out there looking, find lots of beekeeping websites and read everything. And, and very soon you'll find out that 
they will conflict with each other, and they'll be calling each other names, and they're all right and they're all wrong, depending on circumstance. So, uh, so some of them are better than others, but usually the ones that we link to from our website are pretty good. We don't go too far out when we link to some of those. Uh, we, I think we've mentioned the hands-on classes and mentoring. From our association standpoint, our mentoring is kind of limited because our more advanced beekeepers keep leaving on us. So it's tough to build up a pool of, of mentors. Uh, but if you're looking for them, it's where you're going to find them. Uh, if you're looking for them, it's where you're going to find them. Yeah. But usually at, at all of our meetings, we usually have beekeepers with knowledge, so please start asking. Uh, this is a slide that probably should have been deleted, but that's, we have our mission statement out on the website, and there's a lot of words in it. And here's what, we have monthly meetings, that's great. And, back to more, more information, so I'm going to get uh, Jerry up here, and he's going to be talking a little, little bit about uh, when you get to... Uh, Getting closer to getting your bees. What are going to be your questions? Uh, what's your most important concerns? So the key is asking lots of questions. That's <laughs> what <laughs> All right. Okay, there's Absolutely. So excited. What a crowd of people. I had no idea. I was told to be like 10 people. But I are extremely lucky. Is anybody right now in this room a beekeeper? Anybody? So there are some beekeepers. Okay, so you're trying to get a little better being a beekeeper. I start, when I did start out, this is a little brief introduction about me. My name is Jerry Gominda. When I started out, it was about 1987. Um, like I was like 10 years old. And um, <laughs> so, anyway, I didn't know anything about bee clubs. I didn't know about bee meetings. I didn't know about bees. Um, we talked about the Utah. George talked about the cost here. My cost of getting involved with bees is about $2,000. Some guy, I had a big farm, a guy was putting bees on my farm. A couple years later, he wanted to leave south and sell me his bees, and I bought his bees. Worst thing I ever did. Worst thing. <laughs> and I tried to learn bees on my own for a couple of years, and it was the second worst thing I ever did. It was a horror story. Um, so now I'm going to try to work through these films in the middle of pictures here. So planning for bee arrival. So what kind of hives? Where will they go? What kind of bees? Preparation. I heard somebody back in the room ask about putting bees rural in the city or wherever based on regulations. I do live in Gig Harbor. Um, I don't know the Gig Harbor regulations. I have had problems in the past with neighbors about my bees. Bees uh, like anything. When they eat stuff, they put stuff out like poop. They can make a mess on really beautiful cars. Believe it or not, they make a mess. And uh, that can be a complaint. Um, um, bees that they, there are two things that I found that bees really like in my some of the neighbors I've been in. They love hot tubs, hot hot tubs or swimming pools. For some reason, the chlorine. I don't know why, but I've had neighbors. You know, I, I've heard we you know met the neighbors and I say, my God, I we took the top off our hot tub. There was like two thousand bees scattered in there because they can't swim very good, but they're going into the chlorine. So, when you do place your bees, let's see if we got it for the next slide here. Oh, these are things you want to pay attention to. So, sun, wind, space for flight, spacing, 30 meters. I don't know what that means. Um, but a couple of things I've learned through the years that I look for, I, I never have a problem putting my bees. Somebody asked me about putting my bees. I, I put some of bees on my property. Most all my bees are scattered around the harbor in different rural areas. Um, I've had them in Port Orchard. I had a, there was a place in Port Orchard I used to keep about uh, 50 to 100 up beehives. Um, I look for open. Bees need to have open. I look, I always face my bees for some reason. I have consistently faced my bees in this part of the country, um, kind of a southwesterly area. I like my bees to get the sunshine first thing in the morning. I like to put my bees when I put my beehive on. I think, okay, the sun comes up there. I want the first time that sun comes over those mountains, I want to hit my bees. The worst thing you do is put your bees in the trees because the trees shade your bees. So your bees, it takes, it, they get, as soon as that beehive warms up, the bees are out working like nuts. Or they go out and they fly. They're house cleaning in the wintertime. Even when it's in January, when it's, it's 32 degrees in the morning, as soon as that sun hits that box, it starts absorbing heat. 
those bees are getting active. Um, that's a good thing. Let's get plenty of food for them because they get active and start. For, so space for flight. If you put your bees through, if you live in a little, uh, uh, a, a, a very tight or a neighborhood, a gated area, you got fencing. You don't want your doorways next to your fence. These are all things you guys are going to learn throughout this whole class. Um, where should I put my heat? My put my hives. When? <laughs> How often? Can I open the hives? Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Learn about that. I know the worst thing that I have ever experienced with beekeepers is that they always want to go look at their hives. They want to get in there and look at them and get in there. But there's a whole bunch of things. You'll learn about that. About the worst thing you need to put your queen at high risk. As soon as you start getting that beehive and pulling there, you're making them upset a little bit. You're disturbing their activity. You get a risk of killing the, the queen. You don't want to do that. Um, how do I keep the smoker lit? Oh, that's a, a class I've, I've done before. Because that's always, I hear people about that, I have a doggone smoker, and they got all this armor on, the bees are getting stung, they're staying on my crazy, they don't worry about the smoker, can't keep going. And that, that can be a nightmare. What is the proper way to inspect my hive? You're going to learn all about that. How long should it take to inspect my eyes? That's a good question. Where's the queen? That's something that I, I always, I read about it all the time. I read about it, I hear about it. I uh, went through my hives, can't find that queen. It mustn't be a queen. I gotta buy a queen. They're paying, spend a lot of money to buy a queen. I hear next thing they put a queen in, next week they say, the queen's dead. Well, the queen just did. The queen died because you had a queen in there. Because you can't find her doesn't mean you don't have her. And uh, most of the time, when I go through my beehives, probably, um, crime your sake, I'll go through 100 beehives in a, in a good afternoon. Um, I might find five coins. I don't care. I know they're there because there's all kinds of there's all kinds of things you're learn about. You don't know if you got a queen by the way the bees are flying out of the doors, the activity, the bringing up pollen. If they're flying, every hive should be fairly consistent wherever they're located at. Um, why is a hive stuck? Oh, why is the hive stuck together? <laughs> you guys talking about that? This, somebody said about that. You did. Sat. The propolis. The propolis. It's unbelievable. Neat stuff, fascinating stuff. They don't even know. I've read all kinds of stuff about how it's made and where the bees get it. And all throughout the world, where the bees are, there's all different kinds of forest and vegetation. They get the sap out of those trees, pretty much like the pine trees around you, the fir trees. They get that sap and make that propolis. Fantastic. There's a lot of beekeepers told me years ago that if a beehive makes a lot of propolis, that's not good. And I've had them actually propolis the whole doorway. Close it up. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll fill that doorway. They'll block every single thing off. And you can't break them apart. You can't pull frames out. You pull a frame, the frame pulls apart because the glue is so glued up. But don't ever, I'll tell you, you never learn this. You probably won't even cover this in a meeting. But when you get propolis, and I scrape a whole bunch of that stuff. Neat stuff. Kind of gets a little gumball. I like chewing gum. I put that in my mouth one time, tried to do that up. That's the worst thing, worst thing I ever did. I still got it in my mouth. It stuck up my dick. You can't, I don't know how you get rid of this stuff. You get through turpentine to get it out. So every propolis, wax is okay, but another problem. That stuff that bees make is really sticky stuff. And uh, people actually harvest that. So I was talking to somebody about earlier about tooling up. Beekeepers tool up for doing different things. They do pollination, they make honey, they collect uh, pollen and different propolis. I run pollen traps and I do, I too up for honey and pollen. So I run about um, 35 pollen traps a season. I do, last year I did uh, about 2,000 pounds of pollen. Um, I sell my pollen to guys, I sell it all raw, I don't even worry about it. Uh, last year I got five, 550 a pound for pollen. I get, um, I say I run about, I get about 2,000 pounds of pollen. Um, summer, beer inspections. Add room for the bees. What is that room for? Are they healthy? Are they going to swarm? Do they need a new queen? Do they have mites or diseases? This is a really important slide. This is a real important one. And if you don't learn this in this bee class and pass your test and learn this, you won't become a very good beekeeper. You're going to lose your bees. This is a very important slide. So, because inspections goes about learning about where your queen is, when, how often you go look at them. Adding room for the bees, and, and I, everybody in this room who's going to get involved, I'm a bee manager. I take care of Mother Nature's bees. They're not my bees. People say, you got your bees. I don't own bees. Mother Nature owns bees. I, let, I rent them my boxes, and they pay me a hundred. I got the materials. That's all I do. I manage them. I move them around. I give them a little home every now and then. Move them to different places. I make sure they're warm. I open the hives up, make sure they're dry. Um, I move them up to different places for nectar flows, so they get more honey. They make, to pay me. 
for my time, and I get about, and eh, works at about 11 cents an hour. <laughs> good therapy. It is cheap therapy. It is good therapy. Um, so it's about my fourth love of bees. Um, so, next one. Well, if anybody has any questions, ask questions, okay? I like questions. So, so what is the room for? Oh, the room. Yeah. Well, that's a great, that is a, that's a great question. So, if you get married, and you own a house with one apartment with one bedroom, and then you stop with some kids, what do you do? You either add some rooms on it, or you move to something bigger. Bees are the same way. Paul was talking about that earlier, about the population. He showed a slide there, 10 to 60,000 beehives. And you saw that curve. And that curve was in January. Right now, we're in a really odd period of time. Our weather is not right. Our weather is not right. Um, if you look at all the flowers and trees or whatever. So the room is making, and, and as you manage your bees, because one thing you don't want your bees to do, I don't want my bees to do, I don't want them to swarm. But like um, Georgia said, that's a natural thing. Mother Nature said, in order for bees to be, the, the, the one thing that Mother Nature wanted bees to do and be really successful was to pollinate, to make more seeds, to make flowers, make nectar, all of them, make, make flowers, so they made more nectar, made more seeds. In order to do that really successfully, they got to multiply. So they swarm. That's a natural thing. That switch turns on to swarm, they're going to swarm. You'll learn. And so what you do, so one of the things is we know when we know as the boxes, these boxes here, we start out with typically, you'll have two boxes, we call them brew chambers, that's their home. That's their home all year round. Everything above that you add on there, that's yours, that's your honey. But those two boxes, as they fill up, and you look at, you manage them, you say, okay, it's time to put another, you put a box on there. Don't want to put it on the tour, at least you give them too much room, and then other bees might come in and invade and say, look, there's no bees down here, and they might take the honey and wax and cause damage. So you learn how to add the boxes, how to control that room, when to add the boxes, or when to take boxes off. That's what the room's all about. Sorry to ask another question. No, that's, friend, don't ever do that again. This, this woman that I know, who had bees, she used to keep bees a long time ago and sell honey, and she was making a pretty good money out, she said, she never really paid attention to the queen. She said when there's a new queen in the hive, they just like duke it out, and then the strongest queen lives. But she never... Where does she live? California. Absolutely. In California, that's okay. You do that down there. California, you don't just let that how. In fact, this, when I started bees, it was kind of way. My bees did look great, and I didn't, I didn't know about them. They would, they would swarm, and they'd get a new queen, they'd duke it out, the hive would keep growing. I didn't worry about mites, I didn't worry about diseases. And they're making lots of honey, and that swarm, God knows where it went, went in that stump that George has got in his backyard. And uh, I, I didn't care about it. But it got, it got a lot worse with the mites and different things and that. But in parts where it's very warm, and they're, they're going to swarm. If you don't manage that room, they're going to swarm, but they're going to make a new a queen. Around here, the problem with making it when they swarm, because of our weather is kind of not very stable, and you'll learn this, that what's bad when they swarm, and yeah, you look at them, you might have five or six queen cells, and they're going to all hatch, and they're going to duke it out, and that one queen says, okay, yeah, I won. I'm the queen of this colony. And that queen, but that queen requires, she's got about a two-week period to fly out there to get mated with those drones in that drone congregation area, and the weather better be nice, better be above 60 degrees, or she won't fly. And so, have we ever seen it cooler in the month? And this could happen the way the season's going. It looks like, I'm going to guess we're going to start seeing swarms around May. In May, so the minute it swarms, and that queen hatches, and that, those queens duke it out, and there's one queen in there. Now she has to go out and get inseminated, get fertilized by drones. If it pours down raining for two weeks, she will not fight on that queen. If she doesn't do it in those first two weeks, she is done. And your hive is done. Your workers will turn into laying queens, or laying workers. And your hive will go downhill, you lose your population, and they will die. Down. So, as far as not worry about that. So, you move the, you take the queen out and move her? And you'll learn all about that. You'll learn all about that in this class. About the queens making room, you're going to learn all about that. So, as we move along here, I promise it wouldn't take more than three hours. Are they going to swarms and do we need a queen? So, these, things, these are really, these are, these are real key things to managing a bee hive. So, 
What do we got? In the fall time. The fall. Around here is very important. If I lived in California, I wouldn't worry about it. California is like fall time. In the winter time, I have friends of mine live in California, and they tell me, well, yeah, the weather's really rough. It's 65 degrees here. Well, it's 32 degrees here. And if I don't have a lot of stores, my bees aren't ready to winter, they are not going to make it. They're going to freeze. They're going to get hypothermia. If I don't have my hives set in the right place, they're going to get soaked with rain. <clears throat> and just like I tell you, treat, you think about bees like you're yourself. If I walk out there in December, it's pouring down rain, and I don't have any, if I get soaked and wet, and I'm going to go walk over them, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to make it. Be the same way. In the boxes, you learn about preparing them for the fall because around here, it's not like California. It's not like Florida. It's not dry and warm or dry. So, for the most part. Um, so, we got the shape. So, these are all things you're going to learn about preparing your hives. It's just seasonal in the fall time. So, they will make it through that winter. So, come January, come February. Typically, February, I start working my bees. Next weekend, I'm all done well. I do all my videos. Next week, I've gone, looked at them several times, walked around, made up with them. Next weekend, I'm going full tilt. I'll be spending Saturday and Sunday. I have a truckload of boxes and equipment. I'm going to my bee yards. I'm working my bees hard for Saturday and Sunday. And uh, the cleaning your gear, probably store equipment, that's important. We've got things like wax moths and that kind of stuff. Uh, and harvesting, of course, you're getting your money pay back from those bays for leasing your, your uh, Last year I had a good season. I had I did about uh, 300 to 400 gallons on last year. It wasn't bad. And that was off, I figure, off about 50 highs. So winter, winter protection. And this goes back to one of the first slides that showed about where to place your bees at. Protecting your bees through the winter. A um, lot, and you're learning all about that because, like I say, I place my bees so they're the door entrances are kind of facing the southerly, westerly, southwesterly. Um, but it's also that's where the weather comes up in the winter time. I block my door, my beehives. I block, I block them to kind of protect them from the wind, but uh, also to keep the little mice from going. And mice love those beehives. I'm telling you, man, they do so much damage. But the bees all go on the top, and they all get all bundled up and they're all tight and conserving their energy and staying warm. That lower section is nice and dry. Ugh, it's a perfect place for mice to go in there and put their nest and make a mess down there and chew things up. Um, which is the predators and vandals. Uh, and you learn about the sizes. Because in, in bee equipment, all the bee equipment in the we we'll talk about the sizes of it. And next week we we'll talk about the sizes. There's an ideal, thanks to have figured out the ideal size of everything that the bees like, which is like three eighths of an inch. And that goes, that's what the bees can get through. The bees can go through three eighths. The door entrance, you want it to be three eighths of an inch. What happens is, Paul had said earlier about the bees, are, they're stinging, they're chewing, they're biting, and they like to chew these things and make them big openings where mice go through those things. The mice only need about a half inch to get through, and they will go in those nice homes. Um, Snow blocking the entrance. We don't worry about that too much, unless, of course, you're up in Cascades or bees up there or up high in the mountains down here. We don't worry about snow. We're about putting your bees. Now, I have had my bees in a bee yard, and uh, man, I had a great bee yard. I remember one year, it was fantastic. And um, up where we were, George, where you up there one time, up there in the mountains. And uh, it poured down rain. I never thought about it. I went up in the week, and oh my God, I had like 35 beehives just pouring the water. It wasn't good. They, they can't swim out of them. <laughs> and uh, we don't put holes on top of our beehives. California, they got holes on top of the bee for ventilation. Now, we need that down here. Make it plenty of ventilation. Um, read about beekeeping. I tell it, George talked about that, about the bee club and its library. They got a great library. And I suggest, I tell people all that, because people ask them, when I sell honey, in places I go, I'll talk about bees all day long. Um, my wife is Bambi, talk about bees. Most everywhere she goes with me. I can't dinner, whatever. We can't talk about this. But I tell everybody, go to the library. There's all kinds of reading material. Um, I'm not big. There's a whole bunch of stuff online. There's a guy. Uh, one of the, the bee magazines that I subscribe to is the American Bee Journal. I like it very, very well. Very scientific. There's a bunch of writers in there. There's a bunch of there's guys that read and write about 
go to general. And I and I bring a bunch of my old catalogs or magazines. I mean, the B meetings. I got boxes of them. I've got them going to go back for 10, 15 years. I bring people and a lot of that stuff. 10 years ago, I could get that right here at that Georgia, 1700. They still got good stuff. The A1 books. But the libraries have a lot of good books to read about. Um, make a wish list. What's that? What's that? <laughs> oh, is that wintertime make a wish list about what you're going to do the next season? Yeah, what you're going to spend money on. What you're going to do money, spend money on the next season. So, weather. Weather. Cold, rainy springs, cold, rainy years. That describes Washington State and this set of mountains very, very well. Uh, you're going to learn all about that. Learn about working bees in the rain. Um, you don't work bees in the rain. Um, so you learn all about that. Bees do not like rain. Bees get, you talk about getting bees stung? Bees do not like the rain. They do not like being visible. I tell people, you like having your roof taken off your house when it's pouring out in the rain? <laughs> not good. <laughs> they do not like that. And believe me, they can fly and they crawl. Bees, we get soaking wet, you're working with bees. Oh man, I have worked with swarms and that bees crawling up. They are crawlers. They are crawlers. And man, can they crawl up your legs? <laughs> <laughs> um, and guaranteed, you, guaranteed, if bees crawl up your leg, you think you go kill that thing, guaranteed you can get stung. There's no way out of that. Um, nectar sources. As a beekeeper, this is something that's important to make. Um, I pay attention to nectar sources. I am manipulating my beehives because of nectar, because I like I too love for honey. Um, I, I prepare my bees paying attention to the weather and the season, and I know the different flowers that produce the nectar. I want my bees to be the strongest. If I let my bees naturally swarm away and I lose a portion of my bees, I lost my workforce. And uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, you can have a super strong hive with 50,000 bees today. And if it swarms tomorrow, and you lose half of those bees, and you have a nectar flow the next week, you won't get any money. Guaranteed no money. They might, you're lucky they'll make enough money for them. You have all those bees there, you'll get five gallons of nectar. So managing your bees, swarming that is very important. And knowing the flowers, because I had, I put bees in orchards. Um, I put on lots of orchards, I get paid for it. And I've had a guy, people say, I'll go there, I'll go there, I'll have 35 bees in an orchard of 50 acres. And uh, the people, they want them there, and I put them where they want them, and I got them all protected. And I'll drive in the orchard, and I'll look around, and, and I'll see the maple. I've seen one year, the guy said, man, the trees, the apple trees are blooming like crazy. And I'm walking around the orchard, there's no bees on the apple trees at all. And I stand watching the bee guys, I'm watching them fly. And all across the orchard was, I don't know, 20 acres of maple. Oh, yeah. And they were going to the maples. They didn't care. The apple trees they don't give them anything. So they go where the big, biggest bank of bubbles. So you can have, and, and like I always have people say to me, they'll say, well, God, I got lots of flowers around my house, but I, I don't see any honeybees. They got go to Denrins, they got, uh, oh, they've got, um, uh, what's the digitalis, the fox club, there's a bunch of flowers. Bees don't touch those things. Bees are lazy. Bees don't go into things that require a lot of work. Humble bees are strong and powerful. They'll go to a lot of flowers. They're strong. They can go through the little petals and get in there. But uh, So you've got to pay attention where you put your bees at. What, where the flowers are. What's going on. They love right? all these different flowers that they love. Very, very well. Um, so you learn about nectar sources. Pests and threats. These are all problems. You learn all about those. That's a lovely. This is the one that was introduced in uh, the late 80s. That's a real mic. Thank you very much, beekeeper out of Florida. Um, <laughs> so uh, those are probably our biggest problem. Like George was saying earlier, about they like boring holes in bees and spreading diseases. Wasps, ants, bears, mice. Ants around here are terrible. Everybody see the ant hills? Mm -hmm. Guaranteed, I guarantee if you put a beehive near an ant hill, you will lose your beehives. Ants are kamikazes. That's one thing you talk about putting your bees where to put them at. You do not want ant hills. Um, Bears, they, 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 they can do that. Raccoons, not a pro big problem? No, no, never had a problem with raccoons. Awesome. I've had a problem with skunks, though. I had a yard out in Roy one time, and they, uh, um, that, that bees there were nasty. So, for a day we go there. Typically, bees are real nice, and the bees got nasty, and we keep going. We had about, only about 100 beehives in the yard there in Roy, near a swamp. And uh, every, we go, man, the bees are nasty, and we smoke the niggas out of them. 
And um, so one night, this my mentor. So he says, and he was from, he's from Alabama. So we go there at nighttime. And we go over to park there. And uh, we wait till night. And by God, the skunks came out of the woods because they're nocturnal. They went to the beehives and they go to the doorway and the skunks are neat. They go to the they tap the door high, yeah. mm -hmm. and the bees crawl out in front of them, and they're licking them, they eat them out of their little honey special orders. And that was making the bees upset. <laughs> the, smell, the bees would be nasty, so we fenced the area in so the skunks can get to them. What about, what about possums or uh, mouth beaver? Never had a problem with them, ever. Nope, never had a problem with dogs. I got bee dogs. My bee dogs go there. Uh, with my 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 BRs, all my my dogs will make my BRs all the time. I got a new dog now. Likes to eat them. He like he gets stung every time. He learn. He learn. Um, but I've never had a problem with the. the I've only had, I've only had these here. This pretty much. Um, I haven't had a problem with wasps. Yellow jackets are nasty. Yellow jackets are a problem in the fall time. That's where I put the mantras and stuff. Um, yellow jackets and other beehives can be a problem because they can tell when a weak hive is when it's weak. And they'll go in there, and they'll go in the weak hive, and they'll rob the hole. Well, did it, guys. They'll take every bit of honey. One thing good about it in a bee yard, if you, we call them robbers, if you're bees, because bees are basically lazy. They come around fall time, they'll have, they'll have 10 gallons of honey stacked up in a bee box, and they think they're starving to death. And they will go look around that bee yard, because there's no flowers blooming, because it's getting in September. And they will go around all those beehives looking for a weak hive. They'll find a weak hive that's got. Maybe, hope, maybe the box hive box is full of honey, and the queen dies, or who knows why. And then once that queen dies, that becomes a vulnerable hive. The other bees in that bee yard knows that, and they go in there, within one day, they'll take all that honey out of there. The only thing good about it is, they all put it back in your hives. They're still in your hives So, but they can be a pest. And you learn about that, too. You can, there's ways to tell when they're robbing, because right away, you see them robbing a hive, they'll go in and kill them. They'll kill them. And they take the white Hawaii dog. The bears. Pardon me? The bears. What about bears? Uh, we got a yard dog. He likes coming around. So is that oh, a you, problem? You got a bear? Yeah. Well, I've got lots of bears. I've got lots of bears. They, I, they destroy the hive? Oh, absolutely. They sure will. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't. They can tear a stump all apart. You think they can't tear that thing apart? I just wonder how much they're going to tear it apart. Oh, rip it apart, don't run it. <laughs> I've had all kinds of bears tear my stuff up. I got all kinds of boxes. I make a bought a box in the bee club last year that the, the bear reached over my bear fence. And there's a way to put bear fences up. That's a trick too. And that's something you learn in the bee bees too. Um, I have bear, I run bear fences. All my bees. My, I run my bee yards. And I had a bear last year. I got in my bee yard and I sit in the edge of my, my box. I don't use this type of lid. I'll bring some of my stuff in the next meeting for the next uh, deal. But my lids are a little bit different. And I can see the top of this bit here. I saw a big old chunk of wood on the ground there. In my bee yard last year, one of them. And I'm looking around, what the heck is going on? I'm looking around there. And then I work outside about three feet from my fence, this huge pile of blackberries. Or it was all huckleberries. Blueberries. <laughs> Blueberry sauce. And I said, well, I don't know what that is. And when the bear had reached over and grabbed a hold of that and his teeth, ran his teeth through it, ripped that thing and pulled it. And uh, by about the time he did that, that fence got him. Got him good. And so he, he left and didn't bother you. Usually get stung one time. And there's all kinds of tricks. The Canadians are phenomenal. If you want to know about taking care of bees, uh, the Canadians were. That's why I learned that from the Canadians. They got big bear, uh, bear problems. But bears can be a, a problem. They smell honey. Honey is extremely fragrant. On a nice warm day, you can smell the honey. Bears smell. Bears have got a lot better, keener smell than we got. Um, um, I have seen bears. I have seen bears sitting on the rear end with four beehives all busted around them, honey running off their face, they love the brood, and one time, once the bear gets in the beehive, them bees are nasty to that population of bees rotate out of that beehive in about four weeks. Because we're mammals like a bear, we put out a scent like a bear does. So yeah, bears, are, and, and we have bears all around here. Um, one of my places I used to have, I've had five bears a time around my beehives, walking around trying to figure out how to get into it. <laughs> Um, there's ways to put bear fences up. Jerry? Uh, yes? Just a uh, comment about bears and electric fences. Uh, the only thing I've found to keep my pigs in is an electric fence. And if you go out to the, the game park and squim, they have a bunch of grizzly bears. And they keep those bears in with one little strand of electric that goes around about <laughs> knee high. And those bears will not get near it. And this bay's your car, so if you can keep a bear somewhere, or out of somewhere with a hot wire, do it. You're absolutely right. And bears and pigs are the same family. 
And what's neat about a pig, I used to raise pigs also. Pigs! I ran electric pigs around my pigs. For a pig, you only need to have electric pigs about this high of the ground because I can't jump. And what a pig does, a pig will take, put its nose, its ears for as long as its nose. It'll reach down there with its nose to find out if that pig is going or not. And about the same thing, it can feel. I don't know what it can feel, the electricity going through. They know if that pig is going or not. It's not my pigs like to bring down my pets. They had ways to short the fence out. But uh, bears, there's tricks about bears. And one of the things about bears, if you don't put a bear fence up, like what we've done in the past, I take sardine cans and perforate them full of holes and take an electric uh, wire and wire them up to my electric fences because the bear, and what happens in summertime, summertime there's no water in the ground where I go up in the mountains and that, so they don't get a good ground and they get a real thick coat. They can actually, those, and the beekeepers always tell me that, but the bear will squeeze through that electric fence. Worst thing that'll happen is going through and it gets shot and it goes into bee yard. Because it won't go back out. They don't like that fence. They'll stay in there and eat every single beehive. They don't make a big mess. So what a lot of times if I worry about I'm in a high barrier, which I always am, I've taken sardines cans of wire and electric fences because they go around the bee yard, smell that honey, they get around, they smell that sardines, oh, they take a bite of that. That cures them right there. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of other tricks too. Hey, I better move on to one at a time. Can you tell different uh, like the Russian bees and these other Caucasian bees, do you have different types of bees? As long as you put them in different neighborhoods and you mark it. Different neighborhoods. Okay. That's it. Russian, Caucasian, whatever. Well, no, it's good. You can mix them all up. Oh, yeah. They, they're mixed anyway. Right. When you buy a queen, unless they're artificially inseminated, they're mixed. So when you buy an Italian queen out of California, I guarantee you, unless that beekeeper can tell you that they know they went to a, a drone congregation area where it was all Italian drones, <laughs> she's already mixed. They're blended, just like we are. So what do we got here? We got space. Bee passage. We talked a little bit about that. Pay attention to your neighbors. And that is an important thing. Be courtesy by your neighbors. George said the right thing. Talk to about your neighbors. Talk to your neighbors. Do you think about putting the that's kind of depends on your name with this. I mean, you don't have to tell. Where I live, I live in a residential area. Now, I don't, I have beehives. I have had beehives. I have brought, I be in a hurry. I've got people calling me up. I go get a swarm. I fill them back in my truck. I come home. I fill them back in my driveway. Right in my driveway. And I don't even I had people do joggers and bikes. And I go stop. Oh, what's that there? What's a beehive? Sorry. And, but I've had, I've had five, six, eight, nine, ten beehives stacked up in my driveway because I was, I didn't have time to go to my bee yard. Um, I didn't really worry about it. Um, um, I've never had anybody complain. Usually the neighbors send the kids over to look at it. And whatever. They're always, they're good conversation pieces. Um, equipment storage, that's important. You guys learn about that. That's an important thing. Um, so you have the equipment for the next season. Time commitment. Oh, well, that's a fun one. Time scheduling, time managing. Inspection schedule, active. Months, 10 days, two weeks. You learn about that. When you manage your bees. Off season, monitor high safety. Um, feed is necessary and impossible. That's a very important thing, feeding bees. That's very important. Um, when to know when to feed them, how to mix your feed up, um, if they're going to take feed, I mean, it's a, and if it goes bad or not, because feed does go bad. Um, seasonal activities, the uh, type of entertainment you need for your bees, so keep them busy all the way along. Um, I'm just joking. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, wrap up questions. It's about right. It's about good. All right. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I'm open for all kinds of questions. Any questions? Do bees bite? Except for me. Mm -hmm. uh, do bees bite? I've never been bitten People by always bee. say they've been bitten. Well, they, they, they bite. Now, they chew. They got some chocolate on them. They chew wax. They chew. They, they, they sting. Oh, they they're stings. Yeah, they, they'll rather sting. When they get in that mode, they constantly give up their life for their loyalty and their hide. I have not been bit by a bee that I know of. Um, if they get that mad, they're going to sting me. They're not going to bite me, it's just irritate me. They're going to sting me. There are pests in the, okay. yeah, there are pests in the hive, and one of the defense mechanisms of a, of a bee is they will go out and, and bite it. Like there's a, uh, uh, a beetle that gets in the hive. We don't have it in our area, but down in other parts of the country, they have this, uh, this beetle that gets in there. And, and they will attack them by chewing at it. Yep, he's absolutely right. And the fact is, I did. I made a mistake a number of years ago. Uh, one of the things we, we talked about, you'll probably learn about that from you also, is 
classes for hygienic bees. So one of the things that beekeepers and Paul has talked about, about uh, feral bees, and what a lot of people today are trying to find is the hygienic bees, the ones that groom themselves, take care of themselves. And years ago, I saw a couple of bees on top, and they landed on a bee lid. And uh, stupid me, I was watching them, and one of the bees had a mite. Like, so I really blew a mite, the mite was in the back of the bee. And then they crawled over to it, and bit the mite, took it off it. That's a hygienic bee. And that's something that they're actually trying to, they're trying, there's a, a Marla Spidway, one that's working with hygienic bees, and that trying to develop bees, and they become more hygienic than themselves. Um, I saw that, and I didn't, I thought that was incredible, but I didn't see so many incredible things, but I didn't realize, I don't know how they came out. Yes, sir? Did you paint your, your hive like black, get it warmed up here earlier, and uh, are there a better color? That's a good question. Um, I paint, you know, you can, it would work. I typically paint my my hives like the colors of outside, because I, when I put my hives up, I move them. I don't want people to say, but I have them kind of under the background. But I also paint them according to the, the I paint my hives dark colors so they absorb heat. I haven't painted, I've got some, I got one that's painted black. I got a blue, God knows where I got that. From. Um, it's got three colors on it. But I have all, but I paint mine, mine are like pastels. I have a color of this room, they're kind of green and grays and that. Um, I get my paint cheap. I go buy, uh, I trade, I trade honey for mistint paint. Parker paints. I go, other oh, guys got mistint? Yeah, I got mistint. I take in a box of honey. Oh, they got honey? Oh, yeah. And they'll take it back. I get, I'll get 25 gallon buckets of paint. And I throw it back in my truck. And I give them $10 of the honey. And I can mix that dog and stuff up. And whatever comes out, I'm looking like this room pea soup or whatever. <laughs> I paint my big eyes. So I, I, do, I do paint up darker colors to absorb that heat, though, up in this part of the country. Just like this. Place. When I call you to a piece of property that does not get morning light, it only gets yes. afternoon light. Yes. How yes. much does it need? Um, 32 minutes and 30 seconds. <laughs> I, I don't know uh, how much they need, so you mean as far well, you yeah, know. Can these properties be too shady? It, it, they, yes and no. So they, I mean, I, you think about bees and Mother Nature, they take and they work on that one place I am right now is a whole bunch of feral hives. So I know that with a tree, there's certain parts of that tree that gets shaded during the daytime. They may get the later afternoon sun. So yeah, they can. They can. I actually, I have done something different in the last couple of years. And I, I do put my, I have my, I just, one area I have much of these, and I try it. And there's, there are um, all the fir trees that are probably 150 years old. They're just large around. There's a whole row of them. And the limbs spread down about 30 feet. And I have, I have 50 hives lined up under those trees because they're protected from the rain from the limbs. And I found it really works good. And they get the sun. They don't get that morning sun, but they're getting all the afternoon. Every, about noontime, they get something new. And they're doing, and they're just phenomenal. But they stay dry, too. So, yes, they can. They can. And I, I, but it, it, they like to be warm. They like sunshine. The most they can get, the best. Yes, sir. Jerry, you had that qu the question was asked a little bit about uh, bees biting. Uh, the yellow jack is the one that can bite you and sting you at the same time. That's correct. And I was going to mention they're biting and sting you, but you would ask about hundreds. But you're absolutely right. Yes? Um, I just wondered um, is there a way to, to avoid feeding a bee sugar at all? I mean, I know that. Oh, sure. Absolutely there is. <laughs> Don't take all their home. Okay. And, and so, you know, a lot of times, so you'll learn about this in the class. Um, right now, my beehives all weigh 100 plus pounds. They've all got probably four gallons of honey plus, and they got lots of honey. But I feed my bees. There's a, and Paula talked about it earlier because the queen lays her eggs based on a number of different things: temperature, nectar flow, um, her age. And what I want, I want my, I want the largest population of bees possible. When I know when the next when the nectar flows are going to happen, so right now the queen's not laying a lot of eggs. She's laying a few. They got a little bit of brood patch in there, but I want her to lay as many as she can, so that if I know that in right now it's in February, in about a month the maples will start blooming here in the, uh, March. By the end of March, the maples start blooming. About the same time the fruit trees bloom as the maples bloom, and I want that population to be so robust. So if I start feeding them. I feed them, and I know they're going to use that. They're going to eat it right now. And she says, 
holy mackerel, they're bringing nectar. So she'll start laying like crazy. Because she says there's lots of food, a lot of nectar, and she'll start making more bees to take care of the eggs. She's laying eggs, and that's to be more and more workers. Because they take, workers have a whole chain of command, right? They start out in their hash out, their nursemaids, and before they become field workers. So, it's Two weeks prior, Pardon me? like two weeks, that you start eating the queen? Well, and it depends on how popular, how, and sometimes if the bee, if the bees are short of food, I may feed them also. So, I, because I don't want to die of starvation. But I can typically go to other beehives and I'll take some honey out of another beehive and put it in one to make it kind of balance now. But I but there are beekeepers that may not move their bees or may have a bad season and they feed their bees so they'll have enough food to give them one. And then you have to mix your sugar. You've got to mix it, there's a concentration you mix it, otherwise they can go rancid. They'll go rancid in the in the, in the frames and cause dysentery. So and a lot of beekeepers like down the almonds. They start feeding bees. They move all the bees out of Minnesota, all across the country. The 1.5 million, 2 million bees that go down to the almonds. They start moving Baldwin, Minnesota, Florida. They all ship them down to California. They get them down there around November in these huge thousands of acres of alfalfa fields, and they start just pumping full feed because they want to have the most. The almond grower says there, there's all kinds of regulations to pass to get paid for pollination. And to get paid for pollination, they require you to have to have six frames of bees in the, in the almonds. And the inspectors go through that. So you'd say you'd make a deal contract with the almond grower. The almond grower says, okay, I'll pay you $200 a beehive. You've got to have six frames of bees per beehive. And sometimes I'm going to have an inspector come check on that. If you don't have that, you won't get paid your money. It's a lot of, a lot of work to carry bees in Minnesota down the almonds. So what they do is in November, they start feeding the Bojesus out of those bees. So they grow like crazy. Because they really don't have what they, they want to ship them light because the trucks just wait on a truck and they're going to scales in that. So they want to lighten the frames and lighten the hives up, load them with the trucks, get them to California, just feed the heck out of them. And they just grow a huge population. They move in them almonds and they start hauling them almonds. They get good money for them. So there's a whole bunch of different reasons why we feed the bees. Um, and you'll learn all about it in these classes. So, more questions? I think it's about closing time. I'm a closer.